Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Treasure Hunt. Joining us in the studio today is our contestant, Mr Shabby. <laughs> Hello. And what do you do for a living? I clean out public lavatories. Is there promotion involved? Yeah. After five years, they give me a brush. <clears throat> and helping us out is our regular adjudicator, Wincy Willis. Where are we today, Wincy? Thank you. And our Skyrunner Lisa is ready in her slippers as the helicopter's in for service. Hello, Lisa. Can you hear me? Hello, Kenneth. I'm on the stairs and all ready to read the first clue. Well, go ahead then. Between Martha's boxes and Rose's cushions, search for a present in a tray of white. Is it the cat litter? I'm not putting my hand in there. Out of the way, love. I'm not squeamish. <laughs> Stop the clock! I found it! What have you discovered? I think it's an extra large blackberry. Lovely. We're stopping the sketch right now, aren't we, Wincy? Wah, 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 wah. Hello, I'm Andrew. Hello, I'm Lisa. Welcome to episode 27 of... Round the Archives. Oh dear, we, we sounded all professional we doing did. that, didn't we? We must stop. Hello everyone. Hello. Well, we've now clocked up more episodes than mm-hmm. Doctor Who did seasons in its original run, so yes. I don't know what that proves. Um, I no, don't know really. No. Oh, yeah. Ro- Rose has come to, to note Rose. my arm because I'm speaking. Hello Rose. Do you want a, do you want a, uh, yes, there she goes. Grunting into the microphone. Rose says usual. hello. Right, um, nothing much to correct from last time. No, I don't think so. No, Um, no. let's plug uh, the blog. Yes, uh, our videos. Yes, and our red bubble shop as well. Yes, and what else have we got? Also, give a shout out to uh, the Exton Moss Experiment. Oh yeah, which is another excellent podcast that you should listen to. And of course, and of course, Paul Chandler's Shy Life one. Yes, 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 and of course, World Enough in Time from Andy Priest. Yes. Yes. We're, we're but get... don't listen to them yet. Listen to us first and then go and listen to them. Yes. Uh, so first up, we've mm. got Mr. Martin Holmes, yes. artist extraordinaire. He is. Who's going to do something slightly different this time. Yes. And we're going to look at Dixon of Doc Green. Mm-hmm. But uh, Martin's actually going to look at the film The Blue Lamp. Ooh. <sighs> Evening all. If some young whippersnapper was to tell me that, after working for over 21 years on 432 episodes of one of the most popular television series of its time, the powers that be would only keep 32 of them, I'd probably fetch him a clip round the ear all and send him on his way after soundly reminding him not to be so daft. But you know, when I looked into it, do you know that's exactly what they did? I don't know why I bother, I really don't. You Doctor Who fans don't know you're born. I don't know, you serve all those years, do your duty, and what thanks do you get, I ask you. Anyway, more than 60 years on, there's still some bloke harping on about it all, despite the best efforts of those very powers that be. The lack of a comprehensive record of Dixon of Doc Green lurking in the archives means that Even if you wanted to look at the life of Officer George Dixon, Constable of Doc Green Nick, between the years of 1955 and his retirement at the grand old age of 81 in 1976, you don't get much of a choice other than that one where he forces a bent copper played by Paul Eddington to strip off his uniform before being marched off in shame back to the station. And if you really want to learn anything very much about his origins, you have to go to the cinema. Still, where's the arm in that? What could possibly go wrong by taking a swift trip to the cinema? Well, according to the rather marvellous British film called The Blue Lamp, made five years before the series began, back, way back in 1950, when George Dixon was still working at Paddington Green, he got himself shot and killed by some young tearaway waving a gun around in a picture-house doorway. Oh. The Blue Lamp is a rather wonderful old British movie, and is well worth 
having a look at if you get the chance. Yes, it is in black and white, which I know is a barrier to lots of people nowadays, and yes, it portrays a rather idealised view of the police force from a far more innocent age. And for those who find that sort of thing hilarious, perhaps it's not for you. But there is something rather wonderful going on if you're prepared to give it a chance. After the swinging of the rank gong and the iconic Ealing Studios caption card, our introduction to Paddington Green Nick is via the very blue lamp of the title, though obviously it's in shades of grey in that peculiar way that black and white films with colours in their titles had a clever knack of simply ignoring. The Scarlet Claw, the Woman in Green, the Blue Dahlia. It's all resolutely grey, and it's really not a problem. The words police station are written upon that very grey lamp, and as we pan downwards to street level, the credits, including the one for director Basil Dearden, are overlaid over a stolen car in a hurry, being chased through streets the like of which are not seen nowadays by a police car filmed in a very cinema verite style, with no music, just the sound of police car bells, the screeching of tyres, and the blaring of the wireless car radios, ironically making it all feel a little bit like Z cars. After this high-octane opening, and an on-screen acknowledgement of grateful thanks to the actual police force, after a montage of car chases, fighting, shooting, horrible death of an innocent elderly man, over a montage of newspaper headlines, and the old Bailey, a sombre voiceover in tones about the crime wave, and the words of Mr Justice Finnemore, are heard telling anyone who listen that the best cure for a crime wave is more bobbies on the beat, before we are introduced to Police Constable George Dixon, as played by lovely old Mr Huggett himself. Jack Warner, an amiable veteran of 25 years' service, crossing the road to give directions to a tourist, and Andy Mitchell, as portrayed by Jimmy Hanley, a fresh young copper accompanying a lost child who wise old Dixon spots immediately as a little un, well known for trying it on for the possibility of getting a jam bun down at the station. So far, so very cosy. Life at the police station all seems pretty cosy too. A singing drunk gets charged and we discover that it's 1949 and this very polite bunch of coppers, fine upstanding citizens to a man and woman, enjoy nothing more than a meal in the canteen, a nice game of cards before heading out to do battle with the forces of darkness. Everything in the garden is not rosy, however, as PC Mitchell does get a slight ticking off from Sergeant Roberts of the CID, played by Robert Fleming, for letting on to him in the street earlier when he was trying to remain anonymous for which the young PC is suitably aghast, although this will serve him well later on in the movie. Peter Byrne would pick up the mantle of the naive young copper named Andy, this time Crawford, in the television version, and play the role as he progresses up the ranks for 20 years. Displaying the broad spectrum of life down the local nick, it turns out that despite being in the very heart of that London, the Paddington Green Force has a Welsh policeman amongst his staff who, rather predictably in those post-war, post-forces years, is known as Taff Hughes. Over his card game, Taff's been robbed, quips George, displaying what we would now call casual racism, but was then simply matey banter, albeit matey banter based upon the social stereotyping that would get the police force into all sorts of trouble over the course of the next several decades, or maybe I'm reading far too much into it. And so we get a montage of scenes from ordinary life in a world now utterly lost to us, but one that I find I have a peculiar fondness for when I see it. I mean, I wouldn't want to live there, of course. Who would want to live in a world where we, which we all know was so full of casual racism, sexism and homophobia? But it's a fascinating, simpler place, and it intrigues me to see it in all its monochrome glory, and wonder just how people lived when they lived like this. We descend into the dark underbelly of the London poor, a world of tenements, crowded houses, drunks, wife-beaters, broken homes, and people being brazen enough to remark unkindly about boy coppers. It's all fast cuts, as we are introduced to this hard life, where the daughter of one of those broken homes, Diana Lewis, played by Peggy Evans, becomes a street-walking delinquent, and her friends, Dirk Bogard's iconic Tom Riley and Patrick Doonan Spud, are the very epitome of restless bravado, getting away with serious crimes because they're young enough to have no record, unlike professional thieves, I hope you registered my astonishment at the use of the term, they are considered immature and prone to sudden acts of violence, and down in dodgy places like the local pool hall, the real criminals who hang out therein really don't like them much either. Meanwhile, back at Paddington Green, the shifts are changing, and um, one villain's been locked up for cruelty to a horse. Ah, those faraway days when so much transport was still horse-drawn, and the drunk from earlier is still in his cell. The duty sergeant says you'll make him some tea, and that single moment displays much of what is about as far away from modern depictions of policing as t on television as it is possible to get. This bunch were trusted, decent, fair-minded people to be looked up to and admired. Now, it may be true that the real police force were never quite as idealised as this film portrays them as being, but, and so, lovable old copper, PC George Dixon, arrives home, and, like the lovable honest chap that he is, 
he's invited Andy back for tea, without telling his wife. There'd be one extra mouth to feed, which, it appears, happens a lot to M, presumably Emma, his long-suffering missus, who, of course, is not long-suffering at all. By means of gentle hints about good meals and rooms not being able to f easy to find in these post-war years, the tenements we saw earlier having shown this, Mrs. Dixon is persuaded that Bert's old room, which is how we find out that they lost their son in the war, might possibly be let out to Andy. Of course, it's only six months until Georgie's due to retire, and whilst he hints at stopping on, they would have to move out from this police property themselves, which seems rather alarming when you start to think about it. Facing retirement and homelessness at the same time, I guess it's rather lucky that families in the late forties really didn't all have, to have all that much stuff to pack up and move. There's a lovely little scene showing the relationship between George and M of the mustn't grumble, he never stops grumbling variety, which shows us just how loving they really are despite having lost their son and which only serves to emphasise the genuine sense of loss that will be felt later on. And whilst George goes off to water his begonias, let's take a moment to reflect upon the home life of the other George Dixon, the one that we will eventually see in the corner of our living rooms for nearly a quarter of a century, some half a decade later, in which George is a widower, having lost his wife during a wartime air raid, and has a daughter named Mary, and, instead of being on the very brink of retirement, will carry on policing for another quarter of a century. Worlds, even these long-lost worlds, are suddenly colliding and yet splintering at the same time. Anyway, the upshot of all this is that M invites Andy to stay, and by emphasising that, at only twenty-five, the same age as their lost son Bert, he becomes a sort of surrogate son to both of them, at least for a little while. Still, life at the Nick goes on, not the raucous hard-drinking life we'd later see from the Sweetie Boys and their pals, but in male voice choir practice, which is mercifully interrupted by a request from that bloke who would one day be Trenchard in The Sea Devils, Clive Morton, getting the night duty to fall in leading to a mildly comical vignette of short scenes of life on the beat during the hours of darkness, which includes a racy moment of a couple smooching in the doorway, being spotlit by a policeman's torch, an officer reporting all correct to his sergeant, another tiptoeing past a sleeping workman in his tent so as not to disturb him, a civilian fretting about his pregnant wife, and that old classic, the cat sounding like someone up to no good. And whilst nasty old Tom Riley, as played by the ridiculously young Bogard, is still plotting in his digs, and he meets up with George on a street corner wondering how to get through the utter boredom of night patrol. George's advice tells us a lot about his fellow officers. One works on his pools coupon, whilst another is looking at the stars. Dear old George Dixon, it turns out, works on little poems and runs through a preview of his all-correct shtick. As he lights up his pipe, the sergeant appears, and they are both told off for gossiping and Andy is reminded that he no longer needs to be, as he puts it, wet-nursed, before, ha-ha, wheeling his bike off like the old gossip he is, asking George whether there's any rain coming on, his famous geraniums, and whether he's stopping on the force. George says it's not fair on the missus, and this jolly calm little interlude is interrupted by the close-up, SCREAM! <laughs> oh, it's only Dora flipping Brian! There's been a robbery, and, amidst the chaos in the house that was the scene of the crime, Dixon covers his ears until peace is restored and gets a sarcastic thanks for all your help in return. This really is a window into a lost world in which domestic del escalates via cultured pearls, false names, and infidelity to the very seeds of Dixon's destruction. And whilst a wireless car ah, is summoned, and dear old Dixon promises to try not to make it embarrassing for the errant jeweller who discovers that, whilst he was playing away from home, the keys to his shop have gone missing. A robbery is in progress in which Dirk beats up Taff Hughes. At the scene of the crime, the CID arrived to give young Andy the lesson that CID gets all the fun, although through a handily grabbed belt from a raincoat they do at least have a clue to work with. Nobody seems too worried about Taffy, though, despite his beating, and through the pre rocky talky means of a police post, a kind of midi TARDIS. The sort of amiable insults and gallows humour that got us all through the blitz keeps them all calm and carrying on. Another slice of life living a policeman's lot follows as the day routine is montaged from the rudeness of being called Copper to Dirk and his pals plotting another score. Diana, the daughter reported missing during that incident earlier, is spotted by Andy and escorted discreetly back to the station after a discussion of something else that speaks volumes of Lost World, her identity card. At the Nick, Dixon is dealing with a woman who is missing a dog, which leads to some chat about licences, whilst Diana is handed over to the woman police, under whose questioning she cries some crocodile tears, declares her age is seventeen, and objects to the prospect of being sent to a hostel. Afterwards, as she retouches her makeup, Roberts from CID spots her powder compact as being from the jewel robbery, which he reports to his he'll be in the canteen quip making DDI, who is only Bernard Flipping Lee, who would gain wider fame as M in the Bond films much later on in his career. 
Thanks to Mitchell, the net is already closing on Dirk and his pals, but it won't be soon enough. Roberts goes to the local pool hall to chat to a real but honourable villain, who, amidst giving him tips for the White City dog races, explains that he really would grass these young upstarts up if he could. Dirk then indulges in some Chekhov's gunplay, in which dark threats are made showing just how dangerous a character he really is. This being that sort of movie, the gun itself gets lots of close-ups, so we know it's going to become really, really important. Lunch, as it regularly appears to be, is held at the Dixon House. It is, of course, a rather poignant lunch, as it is to be the last, but none of them know that yet. I wonder, this was one of the top box office films of its time, but was that murder as shocking as the one in Psycho a decade later? There's some chatter about whether George's begonias would be good enough for Chelsea, and banter about compost, and it is Andy who has to threaten to knock George and Em's heads together, knowing that neither of them really want George to retire at all. Ha <laughs> ha! Oh. Well, what would happen to all the lunches in that nice room if he did? Nope, nope, we are in less cynical times. That's the difficulty of visiting these lost worlds. They're so lost it's sometimes hard for us to truly appreciate them. In the aftermath of this revelation, George and Em have a little tiny bit of a row, but on the whole, theirs is a house of love and laughter, and nobody has a clue what's about to hit them. The clock is ticking. In the music hall, Dirk and his wicked pal are plotting a cinema cashier robbery, which is all set for 9.30. On his last afternoon of life, George wins the darts match, and the police choir all join in as he performs his little all-correct song in a really jolly community spirit until they are interrupted and duty calls. High comedy and high drama being but a hair's breadth apart, whilst Dixon is about to have his date with destiny, the station is all about all found dog, bigamy and cigarettes, whilst two-ton Tessie O'Shea belts out Tom Riley's alibi. On those ever so mean streets of Paddington, there's just time for one last all correct with the sergeant, who also gets a darts match report, and seems happy that George will be staying on another five years. They part with a cheery be seeing you, neither knowing that he'll be lucky to get another five minutes. Despite their, all their worst laid plans, Tom and Spud's robbery gets interrupted. They are, as the street lingo of the time would have it, rumbled, and somebody goes off to fetch a policeman, and the policeman that they fetch is none other than PC 931 George Dixon, and there is a short confrontation in the cinema doorway. Get back! Drop it! I'll drop you! This thing's real! So, not quite 40 minutes into the movie, PC George Dixon is shot twice, and not, despite Tom's pleas to spud back at the music hall, where Tessie is still singing in his legs. There's a scream and a shout of you maniac, and via the terrible telephone, and relay to all cars, via the information of the radio, the news trickles out. George Dixon shot. Back at the music hall, even Spud is aware of the grave consequences of their actions now. I hope it was his legs, as Tom Riley becomes just as iconic a figure in British crime cinema as Pinky Brown in Brighton Rock. Outside an operating theatre, Mrs. Dixon waits with a young Andy, and is offered tea and, indeed, sympathy, and everyone is very kind. And whilst the doctor is upbeat about him doing very well, and having a fine constitution, which we all now know will see him through several decades more of police work. When Em asks to see him for a moment, the doctor tells Andy the harder truth, that really it's 50-50. George is last seen sitting up in bed and receives both a kiss and a heartbreaking, Oh, George, from his wife, and the film is now 43 minutes in. Outside the cinema, rubberneckers are watching forensics at work around a chalk outline that speaks volumes. Questions are being asked, but all thoughts are on St. Mary's Hospital, as radio operators report in asking for any news on Dixon, and we are told he's a little better, which is passed on to PC814 Andy Mitchell when he phones in, which is a relief to even the criminals, who don't hold with having him shot all the same. Lost Worlds a kid called Queenie, whose limited no-no-nothing vocabulary speaks volumes about the changing relationship society is already having, starting to have with the police, finds the gun, and whilst anyone brought up on CSI is screaming fingerprints at the screen, and the neighbourhood kids do what neighbourhood kids always do, the couple who witnessed the robbery are interviewed. But at 48 minutes, we find out that George Dixon died. The news of this rotten business spreads, and when Mitchell hears the news, Dixon died 20 minutes ago, no doubt explaining all those claims that he sh shot 20 minutes into the movie that persist. Jimmy Hanley's delivery of died is heartbreaking, especially as he then has to tell M. The flowers feature prominently once again in this beautifully played little scene, as M wants them to be the first thing he sees, he sets eyes on when he wakes up and Andy has to explain that Georgie's heart gave out. Broken, she automatically looks at the flowers with a stoic, I'll have to put these in water, and Andy can offer nothing but the hopeful promise that we'll get him, Ma. 
Her flat reply, I expect you will, speaks volumes about love, loss, crime and retribution, and it's a truly devastating moment for the viewer when she turns to hug Andy when she breaks down and cries over the huge loss. When Queenie's vocabulary finally expands enough to explain where the gun was found, her matter of fact, Will you be able to hang him now? brings a dark shadow of another thankfully lost world and a cold shudder to my great big soft liberal self. We move on to funeral day, where, dressed in black, Em is picking some of George's flowers from the coal frames in their backyard, carrying on with the words, they're at their best just now, delivered with deathly flatness. At the station are so many wreaths, and a poster on the wall declares that the concert is cancelled, and the notes attached to the flowers, including one from Scotland Yard, break your heart all over again. And that's the last we really see or hear of PC George Dixon in the blue lamp. If part one is all about George Dixon, part two is all about John Tom Riley, and it becomes a police procedural, and pretty much the blueprint for just about every TV cop show ever. Andy has to remain steely as he deals with rude motorists making ironically cruel comments about the, com about the criminals they ought to be catching, chasing, when they've lost one of their own, and criminals appalled by this lack of brutality. Did I mention Lost Worlds? Assist with the manhunt. Witnesses are unable to identify Tom Riley when he's put in a lineup, and because this is still the ear of the decent copper, he doesn't fall down the stairs when they have to let him go. He is, however, followed and scared. He eventually ends up being pursued in a glorious car chase through the streets of a truly lost London by cars the like of which we will not see again. And it stirs my heart to watch this. The car crash brings the kind of justice to Tom's friends, and whilst he tries to hide among the crowds of White City, through the cooperation of both police and villains, he is caught, and, of course, it is Andy Mitchell, disguised in a borrowed overcoat, who takes him. Naturally, Andy then gets told off about being out of uniform because he's lost his tall hat, and the running gag of Detective Bernard Lee pays off as he lights up a gasper, and order is restored to everyday life in Paddington Green, at least for a while. On another day, having pretty much grown up and become George Dixon himself, and he's asked for directions, life goes on as normal, and whilst we have learned a lesson about the bravery of an ordinary copper, the picture pans right back to that big blue lamp. And somewhere, in the very lost world of Doc Green, the spirit of PC George Dixon is stirring, ready to spark back into life, and mentor another young copper in about half a decade's time, and carry on as all those lost worlds of post-war London are demolished and start fading from living memory, except for those captured so beautifully and vividly on celluloid. That dear old PC George Dixon managed to stagger on long beyond his natural retirement age, and long after his particular style of policing was no longer fashionable, and continued existing alongside more gritty, realistic visions of the police force like Z-cars, is something of a more small televisual miracle. After all, his final few years on screen overlap with the Sweeney and Special Branch. In fact, you almost argue that it was the Sweeney that finally killed off George Dixon a quarter of a century after his first screen death. His legacy did live on, however, when in later years other tales of ordinary coppers started being told on the bill, which also had the audacity to stick around forever in television terms. As a coder, one of the nicer resolutions to the TV series Life on Mars, in its later incarnation as Ashes to Ashes, was to take a moment to make a nod of appreciation in the direction of George Dixon, and, in a roundabout way, imply that maybe his entire television life was also spent in some kind of police afterlife. Thank you very much to Mr. Martin for yes, that. Yes, thank you, Martin. And again, it's just the articles are wonderful. Yes, and he will, of course, be back soon. Yes, he will return. <laughs> right, we uh, better get a shift on because, mm -hmm. again, I've looked at the edit. It's going to be long, so <laughs> let's do short links. OK. Uh, so now, uh, Warren joined us on the sofa. Yes. To talk about... Treasure Hunt. And the time it came to Dorset. Ooh. <laughs> She's walking in the air, she's dancing in the sky, and everyone who sees her greets her as she flies. Treasure hunt.
Hello, Warren. Hello, Warren. Hello, Warren. <laughs> How many Warrens are there? Oh, I don't know. Hello, darlings. How what, are we? What, what have I just shown you? I'm not telling them that. <laughs> <laughs> I've shown you my treasure hunt, haven't I? Well, it's not my treasure hunt. Oh, you've been sh looking at Annika's uh, chest. Travel, yeah. tre treasure, treasure chest. chest. Yes. Now, that's Kate Amara in, oh, yeah. uh, in Who Done It. <laughs> but when I say it's my treasure hunt, I regard it as my treasure hunt because it's the local one. Yes, for local people. For local people it's, in, it's in, in Dorset. Dorset. There Dorset. are some local people in it as well. There's some very local people. Very local people. <laughs> but um, quickly, Warren, what is Treasure Hunt? The treasure Hunt was a French conceit program, mm -hmm. uh, which they actually ran in um, across the pond from us. Mm -hmm. Well, not across the pond, across the channel. La Chasse or Tresor, apparently. Bless you, sir. Bless yes, you. Yes, by Jacques Cousteau. Antoine. <laughs> Antoine. 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 And the, the general consent, uh, the, the general uh, plan of it is to have two helicopters. One is you try a uh, communications helicopter, and the other one is a treasure hunter mm -hmm. or a sky runner, as they're known as. So, so more, more helicopters than the Pertwee era could oh, afford in could one go. Could afford in one yeah. go, absolutely. Yeah. And they're, they're given. Clues. clues. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, yeah. Clues. <laughs> They're giving clues to go to oh, various locations. Clues. 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 Uh, cryptic clues, aren't they? Uh, yes. To do very a, cryptic clues. Very cryptic. Yes. Do we have any wording for some of the clues we might hear? I've got all the clues oh, written down. Okay. So, well, actually on a website, but we'll talk about so that in a minute. They, they get a point and a prize for every clue that they find. Mm -hmm. And once they've got all the clues, they get the big prize. But they're up against the clock, aren't they? Yes. Hmm. It's, for, what, 45 minutes or 45 something? 45 minutes, yeah. And that's including travelling time and finding time. And They do stop the clock twice, and, don't and they? And frankly, piddling about time, going <laughs> round in circles. Circles a lot. Yeah. Yes. Um, but in the studio, you've got... Well, in, over on the British uh, the British side, is, is, is uh, it was adopted by Channel 4. Mm -hmm. Now, this is one of their big flagship programs that sort of surprised them they didn't think they were actually going to get a bigger ratings of there because it started off on episode with nine hundred thousand people watched it that's really nothing is it yes well that was like december 1982 wasn't it it was indeed um december 82 annika rice was the first sky runner who <laughs> who was in the helicopter and as you quite rightly said the co the the host back in the studio is a uh, former newsreader for the bbc who then retired from the bbc Kenneth Kendall and his pastel coloured jacket. Yeah, well, there's a lot of pastel coloured jackets. A lot of pastel. But we love Kenneth Kendall. He's brilliant. He's, he's, he's the sort of... He's so dry, Yes, he's he? the reassuring presence, isn't Absolutely. he? Absolutely. And yeah. the contestants are rubbish, which they it frequently are. Yeah, he gave it some gravitas, didn't yes. he? Yeah. But before we go any further, though, I think we should sort of um, admit to your sort of connections with Treasure Hunt... And Kenneth Kendall and Annika Rice, don't I've you? I've written it down in my notes. Yeah. yeah. So, um, first of all, Annika. Um, you've encountered Annika, have I've you? I've encountered, uh, encountered Annika in Canada. <laughs> I encountered Annika when I was living on the Isle of Wight. Um, first of all, in a steam room. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't were expecting me to say that, were you? Were you meant to be in there, or uh, you just wandered I in? I just wandered in. Um, she lives, well, she lived, she had a holiday home in a place called Seaview. Yeah. And I was about four doors down from her holiday home, and you would see her in the summer. But uh, there is the, uh, the Seaview Squash and Racket Club, which has a swimming pool, a steam room, and a jacuzzi. Where you go and have some squash and make a racket. Absolutely. <laughs> and um, I've been him, and I went into the steam room, and there's a lady sat there, and I realised I was sat looking at a lady in bikini who was Annika Rice. I had to leave. <laughs> Okay, and Kenneth Kendall's an Isle of Wight. This is bizarre, yes, as well, because they're both two ends of the island. Yeah, Kenneth Kendall uh, had an antique shop. Now, we'll we'll come to whereabouts the antique right, shop yeah, was yeah. in a moment. But he lived on cows in the Isle yeah. of Wight with his partner. Yeah, uh, they lived in cows, but. Um, unbeknown to us we actually saw his antique shop yeah i didn't know till you said just no. now <laughs> i did some research on this because when we all went across to uh the other way and went on the bus of death the bus of death <laughs> the bus of death was it yarmouth was it yeah yarmouth yeah. yeah um round the corner in the square opposite the pub we went for um went to a cafe didn't we mm -hmm. yes a, a cup of tea spot i think of lunch yes. and the nibblies next door to that because i can remember us 
I can remember Lisa commenting on something in the window of the antique shop next door, and that was Kendall Kendall's antique shop. So he could well have been in there. Looking at us. But yeah, looking at us. <laughs> not buying anything. Going, they're not coming in to buy anything. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell. <laughs> but it's it's the weirdness of you've got two people in the same show yeah. who lived to enter the island. Mm. Who probably didn't know each other lived there. Because there is an mm. episode actually where they do do the Isle of Wight. Yeah. So I'd be interested to see that and see whether they <laughs> accidentally that? get give anything away through local knowledge. What's you know? that what's that dodgy looking antique shop down there? Because they go to the rock shop at Shanklin at one point <laughs> and we've been in there and bought mm. rock and sweets. Oh, and I like it's bright pink now the rock shop is. Yeah. I mean, is it been yeah. <clears throat> But this is an episode from season four, isn't it? Yeah, mm-hmm. episode nine. And although, you know, we joke that this is local in its Dorset, it is actually quite a wide-ranging show with where it where it films. Because the first episode is in Bali, I think, isn't it? Yeah, they do nine special, um, what they call specials, which are abroad outside the UK. But the rest of them are all within the confines of the UK. Hmm. So, yeah, they tried to do one or two specials a season. Yes. But it was um, the the Bali one is the pilot. It yeah. literally is the pilot. And it was so good that they actually went with it. Yeah. Here's the thing. Again, I've only just realised by looking at the list. Vic Reeves' Big Night Out. There's a bit in Vic Reeves' Big Night Out where uh, Vic does just a little tiny burst of song where he goes, have you ever been to Bali with Annika Rice? I have. Wow. Yeah, so that, there's a little reference in Vic Reeves' Big Night Out to, to that. Oh, and, wow. You know, that would have been back in 1990. So mm. just interesting. <laughs> it, it just Again, it just, just came to me. It, uh... Well, it's produced by Chatsworth. Mm-hmm. And interestingly enough, um, you were saying about the French idea. It comes from Teleunion Paris is their partnership. But they also produced Interceptor. Lisa can tell mm-hmm. us about Interceptor. Yes, tell us about Interceptor. Well, that's, it, it's a sort of it's almost a follow up to um, uh, Treasure Hunt in the fact that instead of Annika Rice or Annabel Croft, who follows Annika Rice, being in the helicopter, you get two contestants. They get dropped and they have to find their way. I can't to somewhere being chased by the Interceptor, who they've got these packs on their back, and if you blast their packs, they can't get into them. And they've got they've got money in there or keys in there or something. Okay. So, yes, yeah, and he, he used to chase her, I'll get you, Missy. Because <laughs> our friend Keith was very into Interceptor, yeah. 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 I don't remember Interceptor at all. So I had to look at some of they, that the other day. Literally, they'd get lifts from people, and they'd have to sit with their back with this pack on so he couldn't blast them, because if you blast what, them, you couldn't get strangers. into the pack. Yeah, you'd just flag down, could you just limit take it to so-and-so? And this camera crew. And the camera crew, yeah. <laughs> so. oh, they also make Crystal Maze. Oh, right. oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And one that I didn't know, that in association with Central, they made Bullseye. All oh, right. And that, that one. But yeah, they Chatsworth been around since 73, and they folded in 2006. Um, but yeah, we've got Bali, mm. Singapore, Burgundy, uh, Israel, uh, Florida. Oh, Florida, where she appears with the giant rocket behind her. Pool Harbour. Pool Harbour. <laughs> <laughs> I just love the... It's a bit like... Um, um, Del Boy's um, oh, Peckham, van, yeah. isn't it? You know, New, New York, York, Paris, and Peckham. Peckham. <laughs> it does feel a bit like that. <laughs> oh, Switzerland as well, by the look of it. Yes, Sydney, dear oh, Australia, and New Zealand. Just, just to throw in here, we were. Mm. Um, I'm looking at my notes here because I did a bit. You've got of, notes. Um, Channel Four did yeah. their own equivalent of Treasure Hunt. Right, and I'm going to. I, I. I my Welsh pronunciation is useless. You, so, when you say oh, Channel Four, you mean you mean um, S S Four C S Four C yes, Welsh yes. Channel Four, which was Hefle Draisor, okay. which is probably wrong in my pronunciation, but it's Treasure Hunt in Welsh, and that was made in nineteen eighty five. Ooh, okay. Mm-hmm. It, I, I can find out nothing more about the program other than that. I don't know who it was hosted by. I've just <laughs> looked at this. BBC Radio Norfolk did a version. <laughs> <laughs> North Norfolk did you with Sophie Little in the radio car <laughs> in the car oh. I could afford a helicopter I was going to say yeah not, not, mm. not a helicopter but in a car <laughs> but yeah I, 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 that's the thing um, for what is I guess trying to be quite an exotic programme yeah it's quite hilarious for us to watch this you know with our local knowledge yeah um, I, I think that this one is, is very entertaining for us 
you know, some people might not find it quite so entertaining as some of the others, there but is for me, so much double entendre mm. in, in, in it, isn't there? There's some, um, there's some, and Kenneth just throws in these cheeky throwaway comments, doesn't? Yeah, he? well, I've, so I've, dry I've written down a few ruderies. <laughs> so, have you got any more in your notes? You want to uh, say, what else? What or else? should we go on with the episode? No, sorry, let's go on with the. Oh, there were three sky riders in the in the oh, end. Right. Yeah, uh, Annika Rice was from eighty two to eighty eight. Mm. Uh, Annabelle Croft was only did the one series 89 that's because annika rice was pregnant right and when it was resurrected in 2002 there was a series that appeared but i looked at the ages of the sky runners mm. now annika rice was 24 when she first started right. annabelle croft was 23 and Susie Perry was 22. Yeah. She, and it all she did the, the rebooted series that you should say that because otherwise yeah. people might get confused absolutely for the bbc and um it's all to do with insurance cheaper it's cheaper <laughs> but it's quite interesting um the annika rice and abel croft when they get in the helicopter they do not put any harnesses or safety harnesses on at all that uh, and, and the cameraman quite clearly is not well there's there are shots of him where his belt being held onto by the sound man as he's leaning out <laughs> film but when it comes to susie perry mm. she gets in the helicopter plus to put all these harnesses oh, on the all health and safety right. did we say about wincy Wincy Willis. Oh, Wincy what Willis. Say about Wincy? <laughs> she's the adjudicator. Yeah, but mm. she again, she's the third one she by is, this point. Yeah, yeah. Anne Mayo was not even an adjudicator. She was appeared Just in the first wander in. Wandered in, lobbed, lobbed the card at Kenneth. Uh, went home. <laughs> Basically came on at the end and said, well done, you've, you've won, or well done, you haven't won. And in the second season, we had Annette Linton, known as... Nettie. Nettie. Yeah, Nettie. I remember her. I remember Nettie. I remember yeah. him calling her Nettie. And then um, Wincy Willis, who did a little bit more. Now, you said about how how did Wincy Willis get sort of her career oh, um, sort of progression? Yeah, yeah um, TVAM was going down the Swanee as it was up and down with its um, its exploits as, as it wasn't doing too well, Breakfast TV, was it, for mm. ITV. And uh, they needed new blood. And she was doing regional weather. She got into regional weather through... Uh, literally being in the right place at the right time yeah. through new, uh, regional newspaper and uh, the uh, producer of TVAM was staying in a hotel where she was doing the regional weather saw her on the telly and went we need her <laughs> hire her now and that's literally how her TV career took off when right. she went to mainstream but uh, she is a um, she does a lot for animal charities now All right. she's a writer and she writes poetry Ooh. And she used to be on BBC local radio <laughs> <laughs> what did you laugh like that for <laughs> no comment uh, right season 4 episode 9 yes. 20th of February 1986 contestants are Margaret and Rob Vernon who are a primary school teacher and a geologist from Yorkshire Wakefield in Wakefield Yorkshire, in Yorkshire. Yeah. Um, there's a hint to the treasure the treasure will show you've passed with flying colours now, uh, Wincy Willis unveils her map, doesn't she? It slowly sort of inches its way up, like somebody's just pulling on it. Um, and we're at Old Harry Rocks. It's amazing. It is Kenneth Kendall's front room, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, because Old Harry Rocks originally connected up with the needles on the, on the Isle of Wight. Um, Devil's backbone, wasn't it? The spine. Yeah. yeah. Um, they're... They're basically pretending they're somewhere more exotic than they are, aren't they? Hawaii. <laughs> Hawaii. <I'm> sorry. <laughs> it's not you really. see all these hula girls on the top of Harry Rock. But we're at, we're around uh, Swanage Way and mm. sort of lurking over Studland. Now, why is that funny? Why is lurking over Studland in the helicopter funny, Warren? Studland has a nudist colony. <laughs> it's a nudist beach. D mm. Did we see anything? No. Nobody was pointing in any direction. No, no. I was pressed up against the screen, but I couldn't see anything. Must have been a cold day. Yeah. <laughs> um, when, on the map, they mention Bournemouth, but we don't go anywhere near Bournemouth, do we? And we were, we're all happy about that. Because, again, uh, people won't know. Once upon a time, Bournemouth wasn't in Dorset, was no, it? No, it was in Hampshire. Do you remember Bournemouth being in Hampshire? Yes, because on my uh, birth certificate, because Paul, um, the paternity ward at Paul was full, I was born in Bournemouth. Oh, so you're not from Dorset. I'm a Hampshire hog. I'm not a Dorset. Get out, get out, you're an immigrant. You are, I'm not you? a Dorset knob. All right. 
But yeah, most of the map is sort of taken up with Pearl Harbour and the Isle of Purbeck. Mm. Now, again, the Isle of Purbeck, it sounds like it's an island and it's not. Tranquil repose. Is it? Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, Pearl Harbour's sort of got Brown Sea Island in it and a few other sort of dribs and drabs, doesn't mm. it? Of, of... There are eight different islands oh, right. within okay. the harbour. There's Green Island, I always remember that. Yeah, well, Can you remember some of the others? Because I never can. There is Arn Island, but yeah. that's where one of the major um, pumping stations are yeah. for the oil. But sort of west of the map, it, it, we're, we're over into sort of Dorchester region, aren't we? Um, but yeah, we've... Uh, um, first, The first clue is where the defender of Mafeken pitched camp, his successors have blazed a trail, so be prepared. And I don't think it takes much working out to... Work out that that's a, a reference to Baden Powell, mm-hmm. the scouting movement. Yes, who still use Bromsey Island uh, and scouting for boys on Bromsey Island. Yes. Yeah. Um, now on Pool Harbour, there's a there's a statue for Baden Powell, isn't it? Because yes. you posed by I've, it. I've had my photo taken next to it. Yes. Yeah. Um, he's sort of looking out over over, over to Brownsea. Yeah. Now, Lisa, you've never been to Brownsea. I've never been to Brownsea. No. I no. haven't been to Brownsea for about forty years. Really? I don't think so. Wow. Uh, when's the last time you went, Warren? About three or four years ago, but it's all built up since then. There's like a motorway, the takeaway, <laughs> McDonald's there. <laughs> uh, Time Team did go to Brownsea Island once. Well, really? Yeah. Did they? There was not a lot there. Because <laughs> the history behind it, it was owned by a, 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 a rather eccentric lady yes. who lived in the castle there, which yeah. is now owned by the John Lewis Group. Yes. Oh, right, yeah. Yes. Get to, people that work for Waitrose and the John Lewis Group get to go there on holiday. Yeah. Because hmm. you said if, if I work for Waitrose, I could go to Brownsea Island. Why would I want to go to Brownsea Island when we live in Paul? <laughs> not much point, really, is there? And you've got to pay to land. And you've got to pay to land, too. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. Um, but it yeah, was, it was sold to the National Trust, I believe, in the late thirties, early forties. All right, okay. When the lady died. But yeah, we zoom off, um, headed for Branch Island. You said about seahorses on the way. Yes, about conservation. Yes, round the area where you have the rocks sticking out, uh, you'll see the crystal blue waters, and you'll see the thick uh, weed round there. There are absolutely massive of seahorses around there right. and it is a, cons- a conservation area yeah but on the way Annika just seems <laughs> to be obsessed with dorset knobs doesn't she yeah <laughs> she was discussing it over dinner wasn't she yeah, yeah she'd been talking to the pilot of the other helicopter about dorset knobs mm. now for anybody that doesn't know i was gonna say you've tried dorset i've knobs, tried dorset knobs, knobs what do you think of them they are very hard <laughs> what you have to do apparently is dip them in your tea to make them softer Please explain what they are before they're, I fall into a heap. They're biscuits. All right. So we're, we're, bready we're, biscuits. Warren's, look, Warren's face is... Just... It's the sensor at the door. <laughs> but yeah, they're hard, oh, red, biscuit, round, can... biscuit, Cut bread thing. things, aren't yes. they? They're like tiny really? bread rolls, really. <laughs> they're really hard, though, and I didn't know... if Had I known you were supposed to do them in your tea, I would have done that. Because... We bought some. At, <laughs> we bought some at Atherhampton House. We didn't did, we? yes. And yes. I tried one, and then I didn't want to try any more. No. They, were, they are an acquired taste. Yeah, yeah. I was. I, they, I was. Yeah. I have to say, I was disappointed. They, they mustn't be eaten. Dry. But there is a Dorset knob throwing competition, isn't there? It was, ba- was it banned last year? I don't know. What, so what, it was for, day, or was this year? Health and safety. Health and safety. Yeah, you could. Yeah, you could do. Yeah. It was how far could you throw a knob? Wasn't it? And, <laughs> Because there is a nettle eating competition as well. Really? Yeah, you have to eat nettles. Don't think people are strange. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> strange. That's why I was born in Hampshire. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, but, should we go back to the episode of Trek? Yeah, but off we go, about? heading for Brownsea Island. No, you said about safety harnesses. There aren't any because mm. yeah. the cameraman's just sort of hanging on to the like the, the sledge, the ski thing of the the runner, of, the runner of the mm. helicopter. Is but, Terry Walsh holding on to the ski underneath it? But yeah, we land at Brownsea Island, which is infested with scouts and guides. Mm. Uh, uh, <laughs> you were, you said you were in the Cubs, Warren. I was a Cub Scout, yes. Yeah, right. yes. What did you do there? Um, we... <laughs> Don't look at me in such a <laughs> weird did you, way. Did you uh, have we... to pitch a tent? No, well, it was weird. We had to, 
I can remember we started quarter past seven in the evening. We had to parade, and we Where had is to swear. Cranbourne, uh, no little village outside Cranbourne called Edmondshire. Ah, Edmondshire, right? Yeah. Um, Edmondshire Village Hall. Wasn't yes, it, it yeah. was. Yes, right, yeah. we had to every time we came on duty, you swear allegiance to the Queen, All right. and you had to. I be, bet she never swore allegiance to you. She just swore at us. I think right. uh, we had to be carrying a clean handkerchief. Yeah, and you know, in case you had an accident, <laughs> <laughs> and a two pence piece. What, to phone home? To phone for an emergency. But there is one thing I really did enjoy doing. Yeah. Um, one one evening we were asked to bring in a old can of... <laughs> <laughs> an old syrup tin. All right. You know, the syrup tins yeah, where yeah. you used to lever the lids off? Yeah. And what we did was we pierced the cans, so they got yeah. holes all the way around them. They put a tea light in it. Right. Then they placed the lid on the top, and they put... Pancake mixture in the top. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. I got a badge for that. Well done. Pancake making. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> and yeah, you said about eighties hair. One of the guides has got amazing eighties hair. Yeah, there's one she? with a lot of hair. She's got really lots of hair, and the other one's got sort of a dyed blonde fringe, and the rest of it's slightly darker blonde. Yeah, which is very eighties. Yeah. Yes. Are there pictures of you like that? I never had that. I did have big 80s hair at some point. Yeah. But... There's a load of arrows on the ground that yeah. Annika has to run round in yeah. circles after. Yeah, literally, literally, she starts out at this camp, <laughs> runs round, and ends back up at the camp, and they've put the clue down in the meantime. Yeah, it, 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 it wastes about three minutes, doesn't it? it, it she runs off into the undergrowth with a man, you know. Mm. <laughs> she got very excited about that. I'm in the undergrowth with a young man. Yeah. She did. <laughs> and I've got written down here, are there any scorch marks? Scorch marks. Yes, that's referring to because um, in the actual clue, it's something about blazing a trail. That's right. And I yeah. think they the contestants thought they were looking for a campfire, but I think it's just to do with like the sort of wildlife trail thing okay. that they go round. I don't know why. I like the way that when it. when she finds the clue, Annika just says, "You read it. I'm knackered." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bit of honesty there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, off they off they zoom. And as they as they sort of take off, they can see see the the scouts who have been constructing this sort of framework thing. Yes. Isn't it? it's a sort of transporting thing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, wheels, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. To yeah. drag it, to drag stuff on. And I say that's what you just drag the bodies away with, isn't it? <laughs> yes. So anyway, uh, next clue: at the scene of the deed that made an unready boy king take a square look at a martyr's memorial. Uh, this one's a little bit more difficult i think and i'm still not i'm still not clear as to what king they're talking about i've seen this twice now it's edward the martyr right yeah because when you say which one's edward the martyr it's not edward the confessor i need to look that up boy king i don't think yeah Yeah, look edward the martyr it's bugging me now all right no it is (laughs) because initially it sounds like it should be sort of you know richard the second off because he was a boy king but obviously he wasn't a martyr and his name wasn't edward so it's not him so we're just looking him up now. So, so Edward the Martyr, yeah. uh, 962 to 978. Uh, king, oh, right. king of England from 975 until he was murdered in 978. It didn't last too long then. No. So, yeah, uh, there, there's, a, there's a memorial. Oh, uh, that's that's why I've not really heard of him, because he's... I, no, I, he, I, he's pre-1066. William so the Conqueror. That's the thing, because people always forget about everybody before yeah. that, don't they? Well, it gets common so many Edwards and... and Edgar's and you know it's all very confusing yeah um but yeah so we're off to Corfe Castle Corfe Castle or Corfe Village well the village actually, yes. oh, well the village is Corfe Castle yeah. isn't it is that right Warren no no it's not it's the village of Corfe with the castle with the castle in it yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It is the but on the map Corfe. Yeah. It says Corfe Castle. Castle. Yeah, well, that's because right. yeah. that's the largest thing there, really. <laughs> it's the it? only thing there apart yeah. from the D and room and the pub. It is <laughs> with the house with the stairs on the outside. Yeah. But, yeah, they, they talk about how many kilometres away it is. <laughs> and you winced at that. Winced yeah. at that. That's not Dorset, We, is it? we do miles around right here. We do, miles, we do, yeah. do miles, yes. But they zoom off, passing over an oil well on the way. Yeah. <laughs> no, and I just said Dallas. <laughs> What's it producing? She goes because the Isle of Purbeck um, has got oil wells, hasn't it? And it's got about four or five, um, yeah, oil wells. It, it? Yeah, yeah, owned we're, by, we're owned by BP. About, yeah, because we're talking about sort of Kimmeridge and all all that way. It's aren't the we? Witch Farm oil field. Yeah, because if you go to Kimmeridge and you go to the like the the sea there, the the, the cliff face. 
sometimes catches fire, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> So yeah, we're Gosh, like. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. You go there and it really smells of like oil and gas. Yeah, and just occasionally you'll see little flames coming out of the, out of the. Because you get all these people, loony people. I have to it's say, a good job you don't go there often. Then no, who like, an explosion? Because there's like signs saying "Do not chip away at this yeah. wall," and they all get their tools out and have a good old hack away at it, and like. All this, all this shale and stuff comes down because they, you know, they're looking for fossils and what have you. But um, yeah, but yeah, what is it? They say um, we're going over an oil well, which is producing oil. oil. <laughs> and we said, well, what was it going to produce? Jam and scones. Yeah, <laughs> scones, scones. Uh, you said Corf Castle. The trouble with Corf Castle is that it's still not finished. No, they're, they're so lazy. The builders they got in. O'Reilly that. builders. O'Reilly. Yeah. Or perhaps we should actually explain it was destroyed in the Civil War. That's true. It was blown up. Blown it? up by um, the uh, model, new model army. Yeah. Is uh, that because there's a model town? Yeah. Hey. Well, let's go, on the way, they get confused by the model village. <laughs> oh, that's a castle. No, that's a model. I think. <laughs> you're, really just flying, you're flying really low. That's the only thing. Um, yeah, they land and I said there's a load of gormless tourists and some yokel locals. <laughs> yokel locals. <laughs> yokel locals, yeah. And in, they're miles away because the trouble with Corf is you can't land in the middle of the no. of no, the square. No. You've got to land up nearby one of the sort of car parky yeah. areas, which in, in is field, like just fields, isn't it? Yeah. So she, she's running down and they're like, can you see it, Annie? She's like, no, I'm still trying to get there. <laughs> I'm about three miles away. Yeah. Um, yeah, thankfully she doesn't have to run up to the the castle because no, she, like, she's already really knackered steep, and, isn't it? Um, there's a load of plugs for local businesses there's yes a, a, she a, goes past a, seedy looking butcher in there's the doorway. a butcher standing in the doorway <laughs> um, hoping that Annika's going to be interested in his special stuff <laughs> um, but you said all these old shops are gone now aren't yeah they? they're all gone totally it, gone yeah um, but yeah she keeps on stopping to ask people the first one just says no <laughs> <laughs> and the next two are tourists the next one says I'm an American yeah there's a unit Land Rover parked <laughs> up in the, um, you know, by the thing. Uh, she nearly knocks an old lady flying at one point, um, but eventually they they find uh, they find the uh, memorial and, and the clue. Mm. And it's, that, it's a cross in the uh, yeah. in the village square. Cross. It was livid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but as they, so they have to stop the clock and sort of reset everything. Um, there's a big sign for Whitbread yeah. outside the pub. And, and more gawping locals as they take off for the next clue. And they're all waving at them, aren't they? Mm. Which There's is, a lot of waving. Which is, Royal Britannia, pass over the composer for a fly past the powerful one that's on top of the waves. Yes. And this one takes a bit of... Working out. Working out. Yeah. yeah. Um, as they fly over a big wood... Mm. Or is it called? Well, it's just called Big Wood. <laughs> uh, I love the way how we come up with really original names for places <laughs> around here. It's a wood. What's it's it like? like it's, it's big. big. <laughs> what do we call it? Big Wood. Oh dear. But it's actually uh, Arn, mm. um, which is the RSPB um, Nature Reserve. Oh yes. Yeah. And we're flying over Wareham Ooh. Channel. Oh. You know what they do at Arn as well, don't you? What do they do at Arn? Spring Watch and. Oh, is that is that yes. round there? Well, yeah. they, they did. They're in America at the moment, yeah. Baltimore. Unfortunately, yeah. you know, Bill Lolly's been banned from there now because he worries the worries the. But birds. it turns out they're trying they're trying to find a, a speed a, a, a power a speed boat. boat or rather a power boat. Yes. It's like zooming up and down Wareham Channel. And it literally takes them three attempts to read the clue, doesn't it? Because when cause... she sees it, <laughs> there's one <laughs> at the top of her voice. She gets really overexcited. <laughs> Um, but, but they've got to read the clue off the boat and they keep missing it and have to fly <laughs> back. So it takes them about four attempts well, that's for the thing, to read Matching it. the speed of the powerboat and the helicopter yeah. Yeah. loses them even more time. Yeah. As you said, Warren, they'd have been better off going to Pool Park and like hovering over a pedalo or something. <laughs> or, the, or the train. Yeah, well, there's there's some giant swans in Pool Park, isn't there? Well, there Which was. Like, well, they're like sort of boat is. things, aren't yeah. they, that you mm. operate um, so they overshoot it and eventually have to slow down. And eventually they finally manage to read <laughs> on top of the on top of the powerboat. It says Caterpillar Country near AC Shore's home, your alien panther is flanked by tigers. Mm. Um, and again, it's not entirely obvious because the it's, set of all this, they've got a load of books, yeah. haven't they? Um, so they've got the map on the wall. They've got um, an audience survey map on the table. Yeah, and then they've got a load of reference books yeah. on on shelves. And 
unless you know there is a tank museum. Well, that's there, the thing. This is quite. Stuffed. This is quite a hard one. Yeah. Well, they go. Well, they, they immediately get that it's tanks because mm. the the mouth the, the mouth contestant says it, and, and Kenneth Kendall says, "Oh, it, it must be tanks." Well, well, I was going to say Kenneth gives them a bit of a clue at yeah, this point. Yeah, and he mentions he? the shore being, um, um, oh, uh, Cloud House, um, Lawrence of Arabia. Doesn't yeah. He? Mm. Yeah. But I can see them flailing about if they hadn't got that bit of yeah. help, I think. Because um, we're talking about the Tank Museum at Bovington. At Bovington which we've never been to either. I knew. Mean, There's well, all these places I must, I we've must never have been, been to. at some point. Um, but I know Steve Roberts goes there because they have like sort of open days and things yeah. like that. And they, they, they've, they've had the Dalek Day there once yes. or twice as yeah. well. Um, hmm. So, yeah, I think Steve Roberts has got bits of tank in his fireplace he has, or something. Yeah, he's got a bit of a tank yeah because Warren you said <laughs> he's got a bit of a tank because Warren you said it might have been interesting had they gone to Tynum yeah and you better explain what Tynum is uh, Tynum village war is now mm. on uh, the artillery uh, shooting range yeah in, in Lulworth yeah. But it but was it was requisi- requisitioned in the Second World it's War, wasn't it? Say, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. not. Yeah, in thirty nine, yeah. it was requisitioned by the army, and all the people that lived there were moved out. Yeah, yeah. they were told that uh, they could return when they finished with the land. They've never returned, but yeah. it's an abandoned village. Isn't and it? it's just uh, all the houses are there, and the schools there, and the churches there. And oh, you, the church you, is you good. Swore you swore in that church. church. I swear I swear in the church. Didn't exactly swear. I did what make happened, a bit of noise. Lisa? I fell over a step. And what did you shout in the church? It might have been something to do with Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Did it echo a lot? A little Didn't bit. Didn't we walk away from her at that yeah. point? We right? laughed and walked away from <laughs> yeah, her. Nothing to do with us. <laughs> but yeah, we head off. We head off to uh, the tank museum, flying over um, Scaro at one point, yes. don't we? Yeah. Uh, Binnie Heath, Destiny of the Daleks. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the quarry. There's another mm. discussion about N- Dorset knobs. Mm. <laughs> she really is like obsessed, obsessed with them. Yeah. Um, I've written down it's long and it's flat and there's lots of cars. <laughs> no, I was just thinking it's big and it's brown and it's hairy and I'd be afraid of it, <laughs> which is uh, Kate O'Mara in um, in the two Ronnies. Mm. But <laughs> yeah, we 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 get to the uh, the tank museum. Although again, uh, Annika sees a sand pit, which is, she thinks is for all the soldiers to go and play, play in. in. Yes. Um, but yeah, they say to her at one point, "Do you know what a tank, tank looks, looks like?" like. Oh, oh, that goes down well, that doesn't it? Like... Yeah, she gives a really sort of straight look to the camera, doesn't yeah, she? And pointing out she's actually driven one. A vin- yeah. vinegar sharp act, uh, reply to that one, isn't there? <laughs> but yeah, we we land sort of some distance away, and she has to get a lift. Doesn't it's a she? lift, which is, I think that's they're waiting for her, isn't it? Obviously, it is, they've yeah, obviously the, worked the out that's car. where they're going yeah. to la- have to land. So they put the car there to make it quicker for her to get there. So it's like a it's a night it's a first world war Rolls Royce it's an armored, armored car, car. Yeah. Yes. and, she and the, get, she the cameraman's help. like hanging on the outside yeah the cameraman's sort of stuck on the front isn't yeah. he yeah and the other bloke sort of helps her up that's the sound engineer that's the sound bloke yeah and how does he how does he boost her he, he can't touch her bottom so he has to sort of push her legs you can sort of see him going oh no what um, do you get yeah. <laughs> so yeah we zoom off to uh, well she was rear of the year wasn't she, she? Was, yeah. yes uh, they park in the disabled space yes <laughs> uh, I, I spotted a golden wonder crisp span in the background um, and then she can't get in because she hasn't got three pound fifty on it they let a duck so they, they turn star do you know it's fifteen pounds now is Gosh. it yeah, yeah but that up. gives you a year's ticket though all oh, right okay yeah. worth it though uh, and, and I've just written down, get out of the way. <laughs> yeah, because no, like there's just lots of people. Bowling people out of the way. It's obviously see. the middle of summer, isn't it? Yeah. And there's lots of people in there <laughs> just getting in the way. She's like elbowing her EPs out the way. And everybody flying. she asks, you know, do you want to know where the Panzer tank is? Doesn't know. Doesn't know. I, no. I don't know, no. <laughs> Found right. some soldiers and they just about know where it is, yeah. didn't they? Well, you said Bob Carrollgees is in one of the tanks. <laughs> yes, yeah, if somebody pops up and he looks a bit like Bob Carrollgees. He's got a moustache. He's got a moustache. That'll do. Uh, An 80s hair. Yes. But yeah, it, um, eventually they sort of track down the right tank and they say, and, is there anything on the gun part? Yeah. And she has to like be boosted up again. Yeah, she oh, has to. Yes. Well, no, in the end she, she, gets she just does it hand, herself. Yeah, yeah. Cause, cause, yeah. But yeah, so final clue is... <laughs> Between the puddles and the piddle lived the Martins, man and boy. Amid the leaves, Yule solve this riddle close by the house of joy. Yes. Now that is a yeah. Again, yes. again, mm. that's a real. That's even quite difficult for me. Yeah, and like I've been there. Mm. 
And this turns out to be a clue to Athelhampton House. Yes. Um, site of the Seeds of Doom. Yes. If they said a bleeding great green monster on the side of the house, you'd have been there. Yes, you'd have owned it. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, we, we zoom, and now we're running out of time. Isn't yeah, they've it? got it's, about five minutes left. The sand is falling out if of time that, very quickly. Yeah, yeah and, and I love the way you are flying out there, aren't you, Annie? Mm-hmm. They say, and. <laughs> what was your reply? <laughs> no, I'm going on the open top beaten bus, the Purbeck Breezer. <laughs> You know, it would take me take me two hours to get there, but yeah. Um, and you said as we fly over, you were looking at the road layout. Yeah, you said it's changed since then. Hasn't oh, yeah, because the main road goes to Dorchester, used to go through Athelhampton, past Athelhampton House. Now we got a whacking great dual carriageway. Yeah, that goes miles away from Athelton, Athelhampton House. And I was just looking at I'm looking at the main road as they flew over, going, "There's hardly any cars on it." Yeah, it's, it's weird, weird, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it feels like it's not that long ago, but mm. it, it's interesting how much has changed yeah. since recording that episode. That if you go there now, or, even, or even follow the, that route, yeah, even the Bovington Tank Museum is completely different now. Mm. But yeah, the, the still got knobs though. Yeah, North Dorset knobs. Um, yeah, this is this clue is all about the yew trees in Athelhampton House, though, isn't it? Yes. Yes. I, I, um, I don't think you've ever seen them, have you? Uh, the thing is, on our blog, <laughs> there's a picture of some yew trees at Athelhampton House. Yes, and it's the with, same sort of With ones. you and me, like, yeah. in the bushes, yeah. aren't we? Like, sticking lit, our heads out. Sticking our heads out. Because yeah. these, these are the same ones that, like, Tom Baker yeah. and, uh, and John Chalice ran past. Yes. Yeah, because yeah. um, Tom Baker sticks his rope in at one, yes. cause when he lets Liz Sladen down over the wall. Um, with the rope, he sticks one in the in the yew tree. Um, <laughs> if you'll pardon the expression, but the final sort of thing they're looking for turns out to be a toy parrot hidden in a yew tree. Mm. Yeah, was it a yellow yellow one with a beak? <laughs> exactly. It's a blue one with a yellow chest, yes. isn't it, or something? Which or yellow, yellow and green? Head. I thought it was, yeah. but yeah. Uh, I love the way it, with a beak. With a beak, as yeah. If they don't it's like you get beak. a load of de-beaked parrots that are <laughs> knocking around the place. And, yeah, they, they don't get the last clue, unfortunately. They run out of time. Yeah. And then it's pretty much all over, except Kenneth Kendall's looking in the wrong camera at the end. Over <laughs> here, Kenneth! <laughs> but, yeah, I, I, I did enjoy, enjoy that. And it is nice to see sort of your local area sort mm-hmm. of on the telly, isn't it? Yes. But it has got some momentum to it that, in, that you, you, you join in with quite a bit, yeah. don't you? Even say if it wasn't your local area, you 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 know it's got pace. It's got, there is a lot of faffing around, and perhaps watching it as a repeat, it's easy to see that. Yeah. Whereas if you were watching it as broadcast, you'd be like, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. that clock's ducking down, come on, come on, come on, come. Because that's the yeah. frustrating <laughs> thing with that one. You you get to Athelhampton, which I think what is one of the most interesting locations. Yeah, and you're there with no time to actually look no. at it. Yeah, mm. so I, I'd have quite liked it to. You know, to spend a couple of minutes just running around, you know, all the all the gardens and I, things I, like I, that. I'd have loved that as well. Yeah, but uh, never <laughs> mind. Because <laughs> that again, that's where we got our Dorset knobs. We did, Hampton. Hampton yeah. House. Yes. So yeah, because we had we went in the uh, and had some Dorset blue vinny on a salad or something. Yes. I seem to remember. Yes. That's the that's, that's the, the blue, local cheese. That's the cheese with blue veins in it. Yes. Yeah. It's so. Yeah, it's a bit fierce. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing at? Nothing. Nothing. Rude boy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there you are. There's, there's a treasure hunt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, Something maybe, different, ma- isn't it? Yeah. Mm. I think I'd like to do the Isle of Wight one next if, yeah. we, if we do another one. So yeah, we'll, we'll come back with some more local knowledge. Yes. Okay. okay. Bye bye. 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 Thank you very much to Mr. Warren yes, for helping you, us. Warren. That was a really fun day. <laughs> we watched lots of Treasure Hunt. Yeah, we did that one. And then we did actually watch the Isle of Wight we one. We did, yes. Um, so we've done a video for that, we have, haven't we? Yes. So you can find that on our YouTube channel, Lisa Parker. Mm-hmm. Just search for Treasure Hunt, the Isle of Wight. Yes. And you'll find it. And mm-hmm. then you, you wanted to watch some more, didn't you? Yes, well, uh, under the 
treasure hunt one, uh, the Isle of Wight treasure hunt one on YouTube was a celebrity one. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me, and it showed the picture. The picture that it showed was um, Annika Rice and Kenneth Kendall in the studio together yeah. as the contestants, and I thought it looked quite interesting. So we did that one, and it was a celebrity one. It was an end of season one, yeah. and they were doing it for charity, <laughs> and it had lots of sort of. We had. Get, um, guest sky runners. Yeah, we won't say too much because yeah, I think and, uh, it's worth investigating, yeah. isn't it? And Ned Sherin hosting. Yeah, but the website that helped us with all of this, um, we should definitely give a credit to. Um, so we were able to look up all the episodes, all the clues, and all the locations and everything. Mm -hmm. And this is on www.martinunderwood.f9.co.uk forward slash treasure hunt. Mm -hmm. Um, I found that really, really good. It, it's good because yeah. you could just go Very through it and thorough. read yeah. the descriptions. You don't actually need to watch the episode. No. It tells you what where they go and if they won or not and how much time they had left. And yeah. you know, it's amazingly but detailed. Great piece of work. So yes. uh, somebody's put a lot of work into that. Thank you very much. Yes, who, that, you know. Thank you for everyone involved with that. Yes. Uh, but now let's carry on um, for another article. This mm -hmm. time seeing Andy Priestner return. Yay! Hey. Mm. So Andy comes back for his second article and he's looking at... Maelstrom. Mystery comes to BBC One in Maelstrom when strange and perplexing events are set in motion by the death of a Norwegian millionaire industrialist. So, what have I inherited then? A set of spoons? Rather more than that, Miss Darrell. In fact, it's a very substantial bequest. Mr Yardal has left you some property consisting of two houses and outbuildings standing in in all 24 hectares of land that's about 60 acres and a fish processing factory you're not serious i promise you solicitors don't joke about things like this my warmest congratulations but when she meets yordal's family catherine's aware of hidden tensions and secrets catherine yes will you sell yordal's holman to me well, I don't know. I the property's really... of no use to you, is it? And I will give you a very good price. More than it is worth even. Oh, no, I wouldn't... It's very important to me that your Dalsholman stays in the family. A strange and enigmatic story. Maelstrom, coming soon to BBC One. In the spring of 1985, the BBC aired a thriller serial set in Norway entitled Maelstrom. Chiefly remembered for its stunning locations and the sinister threat of a doll-obsessed maniac, Maelstrom is fondly recalled to this day, although probably more as the one with the dolls or as the one with the paintings and the burning house, rather than by its actual title. It is by no means high art or the best thriller you'll ever watch, but it's certainly an entertaining romp with a requisite amount of twists and turns and lots of suitably chilling moments. Well, with a drunk at the wheel of a motor cruiser, anything can happen. It wasn't like that. I didn't just happen to be in the way of that boat. It changed course and came straight at me. Are you saying that it was deliberate? That someone tried to kill you? Well, it certainly looked that way. Maelstrom was written by master storyteller Michael J. Bird. In addition to contributing episodes to continuing BBC dramas such as Secret Army, The Brothers and The Oneidan Line, former journalist Bird had also written four highly successful TV serials, all of which had been set on Greek islands. The Lotus Eaters, Who Pays the Ferryman, The Aphrodite Inheritance and The Dark Side of the Sun. As well as being hugely popular, Bird's serials almost single-handedly boosted the tourist industries of Crete, Cyprus and Rhodes. The Norwegians who helped the BBC with the locations for Maelstrom were no doubt hoping that the serial would also do the same for them. And following its broadcast, so it proved as tourists from all over Europe flocked to the small coastal town of Olsen in western Norway, where most of the action of the drama was set. The series had a remarkably speedy journey from initial idea to broadcast, presumably because Michael J. Bird was an established drama writer. He first visited Olsen in order to research the background of the series in the summer of 83, and the series was commissioned that same autumn. Location filming in London, Bergen and Olsen took place between May and June 84, and studio recording took place in the autumn of 84, with broadcast from February 85. 
The series is unusual in that it features no standout stars. The two leads, Tussa Silberg and David Beams, although established actors, were both relative unknowns. Susan Gilmore is also a key player, and her performance here led directly to her casting as Avril Rolfe in Howard's Way later in 1985. The rest of the supporting cast are played by a cavalcade of cult TV actors. We have Doctor Who's Professor Lightfoot, Trevor Baxter, as the friendly family doctor, Dr. Al Britson. Pet from Survivors, Lorna Lewis, as his wife, Liv. Doctor Who's John Abenary as the manager of a clipfish factory. Thomasine Heiner, also from Doctor Who, as a housekeeper. And from Blake Seven, both Avon, Paul Darrow, and Zen, Peter Tudden. Their casting makes complete sense when you learn that Maelstrom's director is none other than stellar Doctor Who and Blake Seven director and producer, David Maloney. And its producer is Via Lorimer, who took over as producer on Blake from David for its final run. Lorimer had also produced the phenomenal second series of Tenko, and Michael J. Bird's previous thriller, The Dark Side of the Sun. Here's a scene from the first episode featuring Lorna Lewis, Trevor Baxter and Peter Tudnam. You must date till June 23rd, at least. What happens then? It's Midsummer Eve, and that's a big celebration here in Norway. The festivities go on all night. It's great fun. You mustn't miss that. People take their boats out into the fjord and have picnics on the beach or in the country somewhere. And there's bonfires everywhere mm. and, and fireworks. Everyone sings and dances. And the good men are rounded all off with a very nasty hangover. <laughs> <laughs> Here's someone you were bound to meet sooner or later. Good evening, Biana. Hello, Anna. Liv. Biana. Hello, Biana. How are you? Oh, so much work, I cannot tell you. That's why I'm late. I'm sorry. Oh, good. Catherine, this is Biana Langa. Hello. Good evening, Miss Stella. Very pleased to meet you. We told you, I think. Biana is the family lawyer. Yes, of course. I'm sorry. I should have contacted you as soon as I arrived. I'm glad you didn't. I haven't had a minute to spare these last two days. But if you come to my office tomorrow morning at, uh, say, 10 o'clock, we'll settle everything then. Will that be convenient? Yes, that'll be fine. Good. So, how are you liking Oberson? For reasons that I simply don't understand, the performances of both Tessa Sealberg as Catherine Durrell and David Beams as Anders Bjornsson were routinely criticised by critics at the time. Personally, I think they both work brilliantly well. The most commonly levelled complaint is that they lack charisma and urgency, but I think that their understated and quiet approach to both their characters and the piece are being misunderstood. Sealberg's Catherine is for me the perfect lead role in a serial, a controlled every woman character who is our way into the story. We follow her from London to Bergen to Olsen, share her surprise at her initial warm welcome by the Jordal family, and her suspicions and later fear as events start to spiral out of control. We really end up caring for her and rooting for her survival, which doesn't look at all likely at various moments. I think it also helps, of course, that both Sealberg and Beams are not actors we know very well helping us to believe that Catherine and Anders are real people, not just characters in a TV series. There must be close on a hundred dolls in here. Freya collected them. And look. They're all full of dolls' clothes. You see? Everything is the way it was before Freya killed herself. Astrid Lindemann said it was left like this because Jordal believed one day she'd come back. Someone was in this house last night. I thought we'd been Don't tell me that a bunch of drunks would have bothered to come back and clear up. Who was it? The series is entitled Maelstrom, after Maelstrom, the Norwegian word for whirlpool. Maelstroms are natural phenomena off the coast of northwest Norway. The memorable opening credits feature a Maelstrom with a macabre edition of dolls swirling and drowning in the waters. The creepy theme music was composed by Johnny Pearson, who is best known for the memorable theme for All Creatures Great and Small, but was also responsible for the themes for an eclectic range of TV shows, including Captain Pugwash, Mary Mungo and Midge, Superstars, and 321. He also arranged Led Zeppelin's Whole Lot of Love as the title music of Top of the Pops throughout the 70s. 
The series' wonderfully crafted cliffhangers stuck fast in the brain of this particular 12-year-old viewer. Perhaps the best example of which comes at the end of episode 2, when Catherine visits the late Freya Jordal's house at night, and finds it set up for a super creepy doll's tea party, attended by almost all of Freya's doll collection while a piece of music blares out of a record player, despite the fact that apart from the dolls, the house is apparently empty. Who are you? What do you want in this house? Exploring upstairs, she finds a solitary doll sat facing a wall. Picking it up, she is shocked to see the doll appears to shed a tear. Dropping it and fleeing the house, she heads on to the island's jetty to untie her boat, desperate to get away from the place. Setting out onto the water in her small boat, she almost immediately spots a motor cruiser turning a corner of the fjord and heading right for her. Watch out! You bloody fool! Get out! She screams in vain at the boat to stop, but it keeps coming for a full pelt. And she's smashing into her boat, tearing it in two, while her fate is unknown. Back to the acting, perhaps the least interesting pairing in the piece are Edita Brichta as the unstable Ingrid, and Christopher Schuller as her dull and permanently begolf-jumpered husband Lars. They are both quite wooden and look like they've wandered off the set of Howard's Way, which is funny seeing as Susan Gilmore is headed precisely in that direction. Ingrid's behaviour is particularly odd and suspicious, especially when it is discovered that her personal motor cruiser has a whacking great dent in the front of it. That no one else has been out in her. Well, I suppose I could have hit something without being aware of it. Hardly. There's a gash half a metre long. I mean, it's, it's not the sort of mark you get from bumping into the jetty. Now, you must have felt something. Lars, it's not my fault. How did it happen, then? How should I know? After Catherine, Gilmore's Anna Marie is the most interesting character in the series, a successful and confident designer with much charisma and charm. Gilmore clearly relishes playing Anna Marie and arguably gives the part more than is on the page. Well... It's a mystery to us too, but that's what my father wanted. And as far as my sister and I and Lars are concerned, that's the end of the matter. And while it's true you've arrived here as a stranger to us, it's our hope, believe me, that when you leave it'll be as a friend. Thank you. Elsewhere, the inclusion in the cast of former screen legend Anne Todd got the publicity wheels whirring for Maelstrom back in the day. But her character, the enigmatic Astrid Lindemann, is very much on the periphery for most of the episodes. Did she ask about Freya? Naturally. You didn't run on about her too much, I hope. But I was curious about her, as we all were, surely. So I invited her to tea. Where's the harm in that? Just as long as you were very careful what you said. Oh, for heaven's sake, Anne. Bearing in mind my position, it's not likely that I would tell her the truth about Freya, is it? Of course not. I'm sorry. But if she visits you again... I should be very pleased to see her and continue to guard my tongue for both our sakes. The series is full of strong female characters, something that was important to both producer Vera Lorimer, who had loved producing Tenko, and writer Michael J. Bird. Wanda Ventum had played co-lead Anne Shepard, a sleeper agent, in his Lotus Eaters, opposite Ian Hendry, but it wasn't until The Dark Side of the Sun that Bird chose a female heroine, Emily Richard, as Anne Tierney. Interviewed in Radio Times about Maelstrom, he explained that female leads was a trend he wished to continue. There are simply not enough good strong roles for women in television today, he said, so I like to write them. Here's a scene from the first episode in which to Cecile Bowes Catherine locks horns with Paul Darrow's character. There are other agencies, and you're a bloody good account executive. Yes, I am, but I might not get fixed up for months. Of course, I could always start up on my own. That would be bad timing just now, I would say. Not if you kept it small and specialised. Okay, supposing you could get something like that off the ground. 
What about capital? Have you thought of the kind of money you would need? Too much. Otherwise, I would have done it a couple of years ago. Listen, this isn't the end of the world. With your track record, everything will come good for you. Even better than here, I'm certain of that. Just a little patience, that's all you're going to need. First off, I think if I were you, I'd take a holiday. I've just started one, Oliver, haven't I? You know what I mean. Get away for a while. Well, maybe I will. But more immediately, I've got a better idea. Oh. What's that? To get well and truly smashed. The mystery surrounding the apparent sightings of the late Freya, the terrifying paintings that Catherine finds in the cellar, suggesting a very disturbed mind, and the free movement of the horrible doll collection all make for a claustrophobic and suspenseful atmosphere. This is heightened by the apparent friendliness of the Ordell family, as it becomes clear that one of them must actually be a crazed maniac. I won't spoil here who the killer is, but I will say that the series' final instalment is suitably creepy and dramatic and ends with considerable madness, a fire, and lots of melting doll faces. Back in 1985, I immediately bought the novel, also written by Michael J. Bird, and lapped the story up all over again. It's actually a very well-written book, which I've read many times over the years. I should add that the series also passed into family folklore because my elder sister, inspired by the series, decided it would be amusing to muddy the feet of a few of her dolls and place them for me to find outside my bedroom door. The implication being that they had been wandering about our garden at night. Completely terrifying. Later, at university in about 91, after one of those standard late-night conversations about old TV over lots of cups of coffee in which Maelstrom was remembered, myself and a friend hung a doll out of a bedroom window, a floor above a girl who had been terrified by the series, so that she could see it out of her window later that evening. I have no idea how we got access to a doll, but we did, and I still remember the piercing cry she let out when she saw it. What nice friends we were. Last month, I was watching the series for the first time with my 10-year-old, and he enjoyed the same things as I did first time around. I think we've gradually trained him to enjoy old TV. He never complains about things being slow or looking dated, and he declared after just a few episodes of Maelstrom that he was absolutely loving it. However, he did insist that we only watch it during the day for fear of nightmares. If you've never seen Maelstrom before, I strongly recommend you pick up a copy. When it first came out on DVD, I was so keen to see it again that I bought the Norwegian release because it came out several years before the UK one. If you're interested in finding more about Michael J. Bird, the guy who wrote Maelstrom, and about his other TV series, which I also recommend, particularly Who Pays the Ferryman, then I suggest you go to mjbird.org.uk, which is a website that's been run for many years by a lovely guy called Dave Rice. Um, he's also written a book entitled Michael J. Bird, The Life and Work of the Man Who Created Lotus Eaters. And um, I picked that up a few years ago and really enjoyed the content. There's loads of stuff in there. And it's got contributions from lots of the actors in this series, including Trevor Baxter, Michael Sheard, Wanda Venton, and also some of the directors. So um, that's well worth picking up. I've not yet been to Olsen in Norway, where Maelstrom was set, but I've recently been threatening a trip to the family so we can have the full Maelstrom experience, preferably without the freaky dolls and the attempted murders, though. To round off this article, I'll leave you with Johnny Pearson, playing an unsettling piano version of the theme tune. As Nick Ross and Sue Cook used to say, don't have nightmares. Thank you very much to Andy for that. Yes, thank you, Andy. Another really interesting article. I always find it interesting when people do pieces about series I have virtually no knowledge yes. of. Um, I vaguely remember uh, Maelstrom being mentioned in Celestial Toy Room in the People column about like what Doctor Who people oh, were up okay. to. Um, but 
I never watched it on original transmission and mm-hmm. I've never seen it since. No, so. I, I really must get around to getting it on DVD because it's quite reasonably priced on certain retailers. Is it one of the few things we haven't actually it's got in our collection? It's one of the few things we haven't got in our collection. <laughs> so we should remedy that and add it to our collection. But, yes, thanks, Andy. Please come back. Yes, please. We, please. We'd love for some more from you. Um, we should also uh, mention Ray Galton, shouldn't we? Who, we should. Who he passed away passed a few away weeks ago. Recently. Yes. Um, I don't think we can sort of do any more, though, than say, go and look at our tribute to Alan Simpson mm-hmm. in episode seven, yes. because yes. what was true then applies now. Yes. Um, yeah. So, yeah, Alan, when Alan passed away, we, we took a look at their work for Hancock and Steptoe. Mm-hmm. And just just go and look at that because I don't think we we can, no, you know, no, you, you can't say really. any more really. Um, no, it's um that covers our feelings very well. I think. Yeah, I think yes. so. Yes. Uh, but coming up now, what have we got? The last thing on this article issue. Issue. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. Um, is another Jack the Ripper jobby? It isn't is, it? but it's a modern day one. Yes. So. This is going to be the last piece on this uh, issue. Yes. So we'll say thank you for yes. listening. Yes, And we're, again, it's quite a long one, so we're go, going to go straight into the end credits yes. at the end. But mm-hmm. Warren comes back mm-hmm. um, to join us. He does. Um, and we're going to talk about... Whitechapel. Good evening, everyone. Oh, good afternoon. Oh, I don't know. It's only four. It's just four o'clock. So well, that, that, it's not good evening. Yeah. Four crows at the cock. Yeah. <laughs> it is <laughs> time for us to talk about Whitechapel. It is. This is in, this is our ongoing look at uh, Jack the Ripper inspired dramas. So Jack the Ripper Part Three. Part Three. Yeah. This is Jack the Ripper in the modern day. Mm. The Sherlock of. The new yes, that style sort of series brought yes. into yes. Yeah. So this is pre Sherlock, preposterous. Hmm. So Whitechapel yeah. is from uh, two thousand and nine, so it makes it a very recent thing for, for us, us to talk yes. about. It was filmed in two thousand eight, oh. but oh, it could it stand yes. up quite well now as a repeat now, wouldn't it? Yes, hmm. yes. And yeah. I vaguely remember. I, I did watch it at the time, it, yeah. or, or, or watching you watch it. Yes. I'm not sure how much. Yeah attention i paid but um you got the dvd fairly recently i did didn't you? yes um so just uh get us up to speed as to what Whitechapel is and what the right. the concept well, is. well the concept is that there is a um serial killer in Whitechapel, and he's reenacting the crimes of jack the ripper mm-hmm. and it's the exact dates when the crimes were done 120 years before and it's it's sort of looking at the police investigation, and your your lead character into this is um, D.I. Joseph Chandler, played by Rupert Penry Jones. Mm-hmm. And th- there was an actual Inspector Chandler in the original investigation. Mm-hmm. He was the first on the scene at the Annie Chapman murder, which was the second murder. Okay. So it's it's he's sort of he's leading you into. The investigation and this is his first he's he's a fast track policeman um they call him a plastic policeman at one point don't they, Did they? Well, that's yeah. we, that, that was used to yeah. be the unflattering name for a pcso yes because he's because he's he's not come up through the ranks he's not no he has built no, his uh, no. built his career that way he's come fast track from university yeah so he's, he's sent into um into this investigation by commander anderson who was also another policeman involved in the original murders. And he has to sort of face the, um, not only the sort of the murderer, but the, the other policeman he's working with. I think the hardest thing is him facing the, the, the these other squad, isn't yes, it? Yes, because they're all pretty... Um, oh, grizzled old sweats. Grizzled old yeah. sweats, and apart from the, there's one young one, but they're all a bit dismissive of him. Yeah. So, I say cynical. Yes. Which was quite a good bit of writing yeah. actually yeah. but you had to have that juxtaposition didn't of you? The, the two set of characters absolutely yeah. Yeah. so and you've also got um 
Oh, I've forgotten his name. Goodness me, what's his name? Who? Man with the stone arm? Yes. I've forgotten his name as well. I've <laughs> well, forgotten his name. Can you take it out? He's got the cast list on it. Phil Davis. Phil Davis. Sorry, I forgot. Ter- terribly sorry. What's your first memory of Phil Davis? Phil Davis. Um, seeing him in the step, the the thing about um, uh, step toe. Oh, about my... ten years ago. Oh right, mine was um, Not good Max, were him you? shoving a hand grenade down Stan, um, Steph, um, Billy Colony's wife's. Oh, Pamela Stevenson top in the first episode of The Professionals. Oh, right, okay. I've not really seen The Professionals. That's, so. that's probably about the first thing I ever saw okay. him in. Okay. Gosh, that's quite a long while ago. Yeah, we're talking yeah. 77 then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's also got Steve Pemberton in it, and he's playing Edward Bucken, and he's a ripperologist. Okay. And they really hate his character, because he's sort of providing the facts. I think you should explain what a ripperologist is, though. Well, a ripperologist is somebody who's an expert in the murders of Jack the Ripper. Oh. So it's somebody who's studied the subject and comes up with theories uh, as to who the killer was. But he's published books on. The... He's, pub- he's self-published yeah. a book, and he does a series of and tours. He does a as walking well. tour, which you can do. You can go to Whitechapel yeah. and do a Jack the Ripper walking tour. Um, now, I think this plays to the old theory of Douglas Adams of uh, Hitchhikers. Nobody likes a smart ass. No. that's why they. And he's so self-absorbed by yes. it, obviously. Yes. Now, now you've sort of got an interest in this subject. I had developed an interest, but yes. you've never wanted Healthy to obsession. Do, yes. You've never wanted to do a tour, no. have you? Mostly because, and they do this with ghost tours as well. Because we once did a ghost tour in. York, hmm. and we picked the one that looked the most sensible, <laughs> i.e. the one that didn't have the picture of somebody dressed as a ghost, <laughs> which some of them do. You know, dress, dress what, a sheet a... with two holes no, in no, it, being chased sort of by a load of the teenagers gray, and a gray, dog. Grey makeup and stuff. Okay. And it was quite a good tour, yeah. even though it rained, and uh, we got quite wet, didn't we? Yeah. But yeah, I just there, there are some repertoires that are just the facts, and there are some tours where... I think people jump out at you at certain points. And I, I have no desire to be scared witless. No, so, no, especially if you're walking around those where particular... They where they happened, yeah. Because yeah. it's not the most palatable parts of no. London. No. And also, um, I, I know, because my, my sister recently went to the London Dungeon, and it's a bit like... Um, oh, there's a Jack the Ripper yes, bit there. Jack the Ripper bit there. And you get... It's terrible. They talk to... You get, you get talking to Mary Kelly and then she gets called away and, and murdered. So, but that's because it's the London Dungeon and it's got lots of gory stuff. I have no it, desire it, to go it, there it's, either. It was, it's played up to tourists. Yes. Mm. It really is. It's theatrical excitement for tourists. Mm. Which, incidentally, when you walk into there, they play um, the opening part to the... Um, Michael Caine, the commentary at the beginning. Oh, right, okay. That was Patrick Allen stuff. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. But yes, anyway, going back to Whitechapel. So, um, they the first murder, the, a PCSO finds the body. But there's a fire, isn't there? Yeah, there's, there's a fire she's at school, been, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. There's, a, there's a fire and she's been helping man the lines to stop people from interfering with a fireman. So, anyway, yeah, so she, she goes away from that. And finds the body. But the interesting thing was that when the first murder occurred in 1888, there was a fire. I didn't know so, that. Yeah, there was an actual fire on that night. Oh, wow. And that is part of the story. All right. Later on. Um, that grounded me. So, yes. Now, what I find quite amusing here is that the whole point of this killer is that they're recreating the events. Of 1888. Yeah. Yes. So a homage, it, ha- it happens almost, on the same yeah. dates at the yes. same time. And the same injuries are inflicted. Yeah. But yeah. nobody ever picks up on the fact that all the names are the same yes. for all the characters yeah. as well. Yeah, so, I mean, they're not all quite the same. I mean, So to me, I'd be suspicious of yes. just about everybody in yes. this I mean, But you're, this you're tainted by the fact that every R- Ripper-related person or similar kill, they must be sick to death of it in that particular area. Yeah, mm. yeah, because it, it's it's... I mean, yeah, we, I, I sort of, you know, was disappointed with the Michael Caine thing. Mm. I went into this with fairly low expectations, yeah. but I actually enjoyed it a lot more yes. than yeah. I thought. But mainly mm. because of Steve of Steve Pemberton. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. He, he does lift it quite a lot. Mm. He lifts, yeah. Yes. The moment he comes in, it becomes more interesting. Do for you me. do you think that because from a science fiction or appreciator of 
archive television mm. you have that knowledge and you're sort of gunning for him because you know where he's coming from because yeah. he has a passion yeah yeah i think i yeah. think he was um he's a strange character that's uh, what i mean yeah, he, yeah. <laughs> um it is quite funny because unfortunately with all his legal gentleman yes. stuff yeah he does he does sort of veer towards hair lip territory it's it, it, uh, somehow but it, it just me- made it so that this didn't take itself too seriously. No. Which, because you've said about some of the sort of directorial t- touches, yes. you keep getting sort of flashy direction, don't yeah. you? You get, I mean, the, you get this nice recurring motive of you get the killer in long shot in shadow, but which is quite nice. Yeah. But you also get lots of shots of London and buildings with the camera whipping past quite quickly. Yeah, sort of swooshy sound effects and yeah. things like that. Which yeah. is a little bit annoying, but I, unfortunately that is, is that, a feature of television. But is that the comparison days? of the two times of sedate Victorian London compared to fast moving That's probably life what now. they're trying to do. But, it, it but I do just find it a little it, bit annoying. It? Yeah. Mm. yeah. But it's very well directed. Oh, yes, oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah, very I mean, well there's cut. A lot, there's a lot of effort been put into it, yeah. yeah. Um, but I, uh, I took a while to get hold of what sort of world they were trying to portray here. Was it was it realistic or was it a bit knowingly strange? Or <sighs> that what is, was that it? is the thing that I got. Is it is it a world of eccentrics mm. and, and, and obsessives? Yeah. Or is it real world? Because I, I didn't get the feeling it was real world. No, it's, it's not the real world, but it's not really... You've only really got um, two <laughs> characters that are stand out as being a bit different and that's obviously Steve yeah. Pemberton's character but, but, and and the yeah, Chandler because he's hmm. got um sort of a, a OCD because of what he, he hmm. he's fastidious I, about cleanliness and... I think the problem when you create a world like this you're looking at a microscopic element of that world mm. you're not looking at, you can't look at the whole picture because you just do not have time no. uh, and, and don't have scope because a series could go on forever if you're looking at the world working yes. around it um, so when you look at it, you have to look at it as an isolated point of view, don't you? Mm. Yeah. I mean, what I'm going to have to ask you, Warren, in, I probably sort of can guess some you, of the things you've been You want me to put saying. my professional head on? Yeah. Um, the Yeah, OK. That there? Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> he, he comes in to lead this team, um, OK, and clearly they're a bit resentful of mm. him coming into this position because, yeah. of course they've got the experience of dealing with this sort of stuff and it, he hasn't. Um, and then he comes in and tells them, you know, you're doing it wrong. Um, your desks are a mess. Why aren't you wearing ties and things, things like that? So <sighs> whose side are you on at this point? Right. I, I'd be on his side because okay. you've got to be professional. Yeah. You've got to be focused However, I don't understand who his team are. Um, and I mean this on, who are they? Are they regional CID or mm. are they the murder squad? Yeah. That's never clear, clarified. If they're the murder squad, I'm sorry, there's only five of them? Right. That's not enough. <laughs> Where's the rest of them? Where's the coordinating sergeant who's bringing in the information? They're filing it, putting it on the Holmes computer system to cross-reference it. Um, there's none of that. In fact, there's very little computer work there at all. It, it appears in the office. Yes, it d- it does seem it's as very though, sparse 1970s as type. As though they don't have the like knowledge or resources no. for what they're being asked to do. And yeah. it, it's a major investigation, but yet any anybody can walk in through their door. Major investigations, you've got them in sealed rooms. Nobody can interfere with evidence. But I get where his character is coming from. The bit that I do find. A pain in the backside is that you have a simplistic manual for a murder investigation mm. and he sat there and he's he reading has to it, read it yeah. and i'm thinking i'm sorry that, that it won't be one manual no there's various levels of investigation uh, and process but i get where he's coming from because he needs a professional team who are focused who are going to take the matter seriously and he knows if he gives them something to do that they will damn well do it mm. but if you've got yeah, that's for frivolity in all jobs that we do. We're not we're yeah. not saying people don't relax, but you've got to be focused. You've got to look professional. If you're going out and ask a member of the public about a murder and you look like a sack of spuds, yeah, it's, it's not going to look good, is it? You're not going to have much confidence in your team. And the moment you throw Steve Pemberton's character into this, Ooh. 
what what would, would you take any notice of him would you let him in the building would you give him house room what would you what would you God. do in that situation he would be nowhere further than the interview room and it will be thank you very much indeed um he, you he wouldn't have been reading his book he'd have given it to one of the dcs to read his book and look through his book and his dc would have come back to him and said he knows far too much that is good for him yeah he will be our number one suspect then you will be setting up a trail about who is he yeah. What his is his lifestyle? What's his motivations, etc. And they don't do that till very late on. They don't do that till episode three. No, he should be a key suspect as soon as he identifies himself <laughs> and gives away information. As soon as he's giving the information of, about what the crime scene was then in Victorian terms, or what the crime scene is now, and he's comparing the two, and they're almost you know the victim's injuries. You should be saying he knows far, far too much. Mm. Um, they should be observing him. They should be following him. Now, you, you have the interesting thing where they make the prediction that there's going to be a murder on this night. On the 8th of September. Is yeah. this the one in... Uh, the Hanbury Street. Yeah. 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 So they've got, like, sort of people on the scene, and it still happens. Yeah. Because um, they're all going, well, it hasn't happened yet. We might as well all go home, basically. They're all, down brick la- they're all down Brick Lane, aren't they? Yeah. But yeah, it doesn't happen. Curry. That murder didn't happen until about... What was it, about four or five o'clock in the That's morning? That's right, people were going to work, weren't yeah. they? Yeah. The, the murderer took one hell of a chance because it was getting light. So this is what makes me think it was a hospital employee. And this is the thing that, 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 that you were saying to me last time, that, that there are glaring, obvious um, footpaths towards who the signposting is towards the suspect. Mm. Well, it's a shift worker. Yeah, mm. yeah. The, the varying times indicate a shift worker. Yeah, when, when things happen is yeah. important, yeah. But nobody, nobody actually goes. It's a shift worker because there's no um, logical sh- uh, logical pattern to when these things happen. Actually, yes, there is. If you look at the times and you look at uh, what varying shifts are for the work in that environment, mm. you should be able to come out with a key suspect. Yeah, but you've, you've got the thing where um, um, sort of Rupert Penry Jones thinks this is going to happen. Um, and talks to his like superiors about it, but of course they can't. They're, they're not going to act on sort of n- no information, basically. And then then, the, then they say, well, this, you know, if you were right, this conversation didn't happen as mm-hmm. well, you know. Um, so it, it's like everybody's covering their ass, basically, yeah. isn't it? A lot yeah. of ass covering, and yeah. it is a well. At the end of the day, they don't want anything. To, uh, the, the higher echelons do not want anything to do with it. It is. A small little job for him to deal with, as far as they see. And they can move on to the next. Let's step. move on to yeah. your next development task because you're my protege and I'm looking after you. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, I, I I do like that's the thing. I I I like Phil Davis. Yeah, yeah, I like Phil Davis. Yeah. His character. You know, I I I always like Phil Davis yeah. in things anyway. Um, so, yeah. so yeah, I I am. It's it's him and and um, Steve Pemberton that I think are, are the two characters i tend to focus on in in this um so yeah they're 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 what i'm i'm looking at a lot of the time to to me yeah i i do from a viewer's point of view rupert penry jones sort of comes in from the outside that that, that's the thing i i can see where because watching it myself i found myself getting annoyed with them when they weren't helpful Mm. to him well that was just um schoolyard yes um um pranks wasn't yeah, it and but eventually stupidity. he manages to get their trust and their confidence so he you know he works his way into you know being trusted by them yeah i mean this this is three three parts well no he does yeah trusted but uh, uh, at arm's length because there is um i still think you're a pain in the arse is what he says to him doesn't he yeah because yeah over the three parts that the the, their relationship yeah you know develops and progresses it's an interesting mixture of old sweat police officers so you've got 80s 90s mentality of investigating Mm. meets 21st century um brought from the outside thinking two do not meet it's oil and water yeah because you can you can see a little bit of like sort of life on mars i think here isn't yeah it? yeah but there is the, like the other way around yeah. yes yeah because in life on mars obviously gene hunt is the superior officer and and um sam tyler goes in as a sort of ds doesn't yeah. he or whatever yeah. he is yeah. detective sergeant where this is the other way around where you've got the more suspicious yeah sort of 
um, cynical character being his deputy. Almost. There's, there's always the fear when you uh, deal with somebody who's on a fast track status that they're going to come in. Uh, they want to make a mark which will mean disrupting a department and they're going to leave it as it is and they're going to walk away to their next project and I think that's the greatest fear and that's where the, uh, the cynical um, police officer comes in they're not going to stay five minutes they're going to do their little bit and they're off we're stuck here now for the duration mm. and we're going to have to carry them but yeah this is merely the first series of this of this show isn't yes. it um, yeah, they, they do this series and then obviously because it gets quite good viewing figures um it actually feels like almost looking at because there's a making of on the dvd release and looking at that it almost looks like before even it airs they it have looked at it and said yeah this has got potential to be yeah. another series it, it, and have uh, commissioned it it doesn't take itself too seriously no. however it's serious enough to be gripping drama yeah because the second series, um, which I haven't seen because I didn't like the look of it, it deals with the the, the craze. And the third series... It's um, got Peter Serafinowicz in it, which, like <laughs> which, which yes. maybe isn't going to help me take no. it seriously <laughs> yet in the first place. But yeah. Yeah. And the um, series three has individual stories. So each, epi- each story is two episodes, but it's separate yeah. stories. And the first episode... Is sort of based on the Radcliffe Radcliffe Highway murders. Oh, I don't know. That, which is know. it's it's a family that was murdered, but the house was locked up, and nobody can work out how the killer got out hmm. or in. Remember and this staff? is the same thing. So this is from like two hundred years earlier yes. or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. one of the earliest murder cases. Um, but you sort of think, well, you know, how are they going to carry on with Steve Pemberton's character? Because obviously he's. Just the he's a yes, he's a reporter. He's got a niche. That's yeah. you can't go outside but the confines. But what they do is then make him a, a, an expert in all historical suddenly all crimes. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, yeah, a bit of a stretch, but it sort of works. And, it, and in series three, they actually bring him into the police station to archive the files. But the, that makes him files. almost a Spock character, where he is his science knowledge is unbounding. So can you really? get a handle on realism through yeah. that and of course there is a series four and i don't think i saw series four so um but it's on netflix so i might, might go have a look okay. mm. I, I i i enjoy season one immensely yes um although it, it, uh, taking my professional head off i can watch it as a wonderful piece of drama mm-hmm. watching my watching it with my professional head on it drives me bonkers <laughs> but that, that but that's artistic license yes. of any drama but, isn't but it? that that's like me about sciencey things yeah that yes you can get science dreadfully wrong and i will note notice it but it doesn't necessarily spoil no. my enjoyment of a show you know so i i like ripper so i went in with an open mind and i yeah i quite enjoyed it. i loved the ending yes i did like the ending and that was well that could have been so badly staged and mm. and ba- mm. and um, and badly delivered but i don't think it was and, and did you notice the visual clue as to who the murderer was, no. which I didn't until I watched it. We watched the making and went, it's not oh, the, right, okay. No, don't, 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 no, don't, 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 don't. You can tell me afterwards. Tell we me don't afterwards. want to spoil yeah. it, but, but, yeah. Yes. But, yes, that last shot is, is good, though I did read on an internet forum somewhere that there should have been somebody else in that shot as well, just to make it better. Right. And I will tell you about that after we finish recording. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah, we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep the secrets yes. in case yeah. you do want to watch it. And yeah, I enjoyed it, so... I'd, I'd say it's certainly worth a look. It is. It's got um, it's got interesting characters in it, and there yeah. is a link between this and the RTV Jack the Ripper, which we did on the last issue, which is Christopher Fulford, who's in both. Yes, All right. And he's playing a policeman in both. Yeah, there you go. So he's a PC in, in the in the RTV one, the 1998 one, and he's a detective constable in this, and he gets chucked off the team for, uh, for, uh, for uh, selling, selling his story, story to the to press. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Gets made into a PC again. Right. So it gets back full circle. Hmm. So he could almost be the same, the, that character's grandson. Uh, or great grandson. Ooh. That game. Yeah. If you really wanted to. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you, boys and girls. Yes. And uh, are we going to do any more Jack the Ripper we things? We might do in them, the but there's a couple more things that we can do. There's some possible things to yes. do, aren't there? Yes. And um, they, they will be a bit more. Um, out there, yes. I think they're a bit, yeah. bit well, less of a connection. Yes. One of them is very out there. Yeah, but there, yes. there's at least there's, a, there's yeah there's, there's, there's at least one more thing, and obviously mentions as well. Cause yeah, 
You know, mm. you wouldn't get a mention of Jack sure. the Ripper in Doctor Who. So, I don't, yeah, I don't know quite when we'll return to it, whether yes. we'll do it in the next issue or, or mm. later. But, but we will. We will. Yes. We will certainly come back in a vague sort of way. Mm-hmm. OK. OK. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 That was episode 27 of Round the Archives. Starring Lisa Parker, Andrew Trowbridge, Warren Cummings, Martin Holmes and Andy Priestner. On the musical side you heard Dan Tate and Paul Chandler. The script for Whitechapel was by Ben Court and Caroline Ipp. And the producer was Marcus Wilson. There's a fire and she's been helping man the lines to stop people from interfering with a fireman. Now, this is... An in- <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean. Stopping the get, fireman from doing their job. Get, get me hold of his holes. Honestly, you've got such dirty minds, you know? <laughs> So, anyway, yeah, so she, she goes away from that and finds the body when we've all finished. Honestly... It's like dealing with children, dealing with you two. I don't so, think it was that now. So Come on. Try- <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're ready. All right. Everybody ready? Yeah. Good.